Good morning. Welcome to Mulberry Street United Methodist Church. Whether you're joining us here in person or online, we're glad that you are with us this morning. We are a church on mission to share the heart of God from the heart of downtown Macon, and here's how you can be part of that mission this week. First, uh, we started this past Wednesday our weekly prayer service. That's Wednesday mornings at 7.45. Uh, we had a good um, time, well, I should say, they had a good time. Of course, I was out of town for my grandfather's funeral, but we, they did a great job um, and things went well. And so we invite you to be part of that this week. Um, it's about a half an hour long. And so if you need to be at your office or wherever you go on Wednesday mornings by 8.30, you'll definitely be able to be there in time. 7.45 Wednesday morning. Uh, this coming Friday, Wesley Glenn is the beneficiary of a car wash, a Tidal Wave car wash, out off of Zebulon Road. Uh, all day long, they'll receive half of the proceeds from you paying for a car wash there. And then there'll be somebody standing out front with a bucket to take donations. That will be me at 4 p.m. on Friday. So. If you would like to come by and make a donation to Wesley Glenn, get your car washed and wave at me, uh, maybe put a donation in the bucket, 4 p.m. on Friday at the Tidal Wave Car Wash. But again, all day long on that day, you'll be able to get your car washed and support one of the great ministries of our annual conference. Finally, this afternoon at 5 p.m. at the James's house, we have our grilling and chilling event for family ministries. So if you, for those who have children at home of any age, you are invited to be part of that. That's from five to seven, and that event this evening is rain or shine. Uh, and if you have questions about that, you can see me or Christy James. Uh, she's waving her hand back there, uh, and she can get you pointed in the right direction. We have gathered together to worship our God and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, this, uh, this morning. So I invite us to turn our hearts and our attention to the worship of our God. The Lord be with you. O oh God, you called us by name to come, and we respond with delight and gladness in joyful obedience we come to worship our God. Rising out of the depths of despair, we gratefully gather for worship. In joyful hope, we come to worship our loving God. Our God has given us a new song of praise to sing to our awesome God. In joyful trust, we come to worship our God. Amen.
Let us now join together in our historic confession of faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This time we'd like to invite our children forward for a children's moment with Miss Elisa. Good morning. Oh, wonderful. Do you see what I have in my hands? Papers. I have papers. What color? Pink and orange. Pink is red and orange is blue. Okay. Well, green for go. There you go. Good job. And red, kind of your pink. It, exactly. I know. It, it could be any, either or, right? But have you ever played... Red light, green light. Yeah. I knew you were going to know. Exactly. So red light, when they say red light, you stop. You stop. Uh huh. That's right. Exactly. I know I should have just called him up here to give all the rules here. But if it's green light, you can go, right? Yeah. But you know what? If you're playing a game, and you don't know the direction, and you don't know the rules, and you don't know how to play, are you very good at it? No, you're not. You're confused. You don't know the direction to go to. And somebody may tell you something, and the next thing you know, you're going in the wrong direction, right? And we don't know what to do, and we're not going to win. But if you know the direction that we're supposed to go, and you have the rules, and what to do and what not to do, then you could probably maybe win, right? But do you have sometimes some people that break the rules to win? They don't do it right. And do you sometimes get unhappy with them? Ah, oh, you, you, you forgive them when they act that way. But you know what? But God gives us the rules, doesn't he? He gives us the plan. He tells us the steps we need to take. And where do we find that? in the Bible, right? So we need to be glad in Him. We need to be happy in Him. We need to be excited in Him because He's gonna give us that rule and He's gonna help us win, but He's also gonna help us not be angry with somebody when they don't do it right, right? All right, y'all pray with me and we're gonna learn more about this in Children's Church. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for being here with us in this special place. To know that we can always count on you to give us the direction, to teach us the way, and to be with us no matter what. To forgive us when we do things wrong. 
and to help us to forgive others when they do things wrong. In your name we pray. Amen. Very good, guys. All right, let's go to Children's Church. Our first scripture lesson this morning comes from Psalm 37, verses 1 through 9. Let us hear the word of the Lord together. Do not fret because of the wicked. Do not be envious of evildoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good, so that you will live in the land and enjoy security. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will act. He will make your vindication shine like the light and the justice of your cause like the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret over those who prosper in their way, over those who carry out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, it leads only to evil. For the wicked shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God.
As we approach this time of preaching, let's pray together. Lord, take my lips and speak through them. Take our thoughts and think through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire for you. Unless you speak, nothing of significance will be spoken. Amen. There must be some kind of way out of here, said the joker to the thief. There's too much confusion. I can't get no relief. Businessmen, they drink my wine. Plowmen dig my earth. None were level on the mind. Nobody up at his word. No reason to get excited, the thief he kindly spoke. There are many here among us who feel that life is but a joke. But you and I, we've been through that, and this is not our fate. So let us stop talking falsely now. The hour's getting late. All along the watchtower, princes kept the view, while all the women came and went, barefoot servants too. Outside in the cold distance, a wildcat did growl. Two riders were approaching in the night, and the wind began to howl. If you didn't know better, you would think that the prophet Habakkuk wrote those words, but they are Bob Dylan's from his classic song, All Along the Watchtower. Both he and Habakkuk see a world that feels like a joke, full of falsehood and fakery. There's no reason to get excited because there's no relief to be had from the injustice in the world and the way it portends destruction. So keep a watch in your watchtower, they say, and see the coming dangers, the coming violence, the coming injustice, and depression. That indeed is where Habakkuk begins his prophecy. In doing so, he's asking a question asked by generations of the people of God. How do we, a people of faith, respond to a world full of trouble? Let's hear now our scripture for this morning, selections from the prophet Habakkuk, that give us a sense of the entire book. The oracle that the prophet Habakkuk saw. O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not listen? Or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see wrongdoing and look at trouble? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law becomes slack and justice never prevails. The wicked surround the righteous, therefore judgment comes forth perverted. I, Habakkuk, will stand at my watch post and will station myself on the rampart. I will keep watch to see what God will say to me and what he will answer concerning my complaint. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets so that a runner may read it, for there is still a vision for the appointed time. It speaks to the end, it does not lie. If it seems to tarry, wait for it. It will surely come, it will not delay. Look at the proud. Their spirit is not right in them, but the righteous live by their faith. I, Habakkuk, hear, and I tremble within. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones and my steps tremble beneath me. I wait quietly for the day of calamity to come upon the people who attack us. Though the fig tree does not blossom and no fruit is on the vines, though the produce of the olive fails and the fields yield no food, though the flock is cut off from the fold and there is no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will exult in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer and makes me tread upon the heights. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. How do we, a people of faith, respond to a world full of trouble? All along the watchtower, Habakkuk says he waits. Except not really. He says he waits, but... All along the watchtower, or the watch post with the ramparts, as he describes it, while he says that he's waiting, he issues a complaint to God. The Babylonians are coming. There's danger lurking around the corner, and no one is paying attention. God, what are you going to do about it? 
Habakkuk yells this into the wind from his watchtower. In fact, up on the ramparts from his watch post, Habakkuk looks across the entire world and sees nothing but chaos, danger, and wrongdoing. So he says the law has become slack, that justice never prevails. He notes that the wicked surround the righteous. He sees a world marked by violence, injustice, oppression, and hatred. Habakkuk thinks the world is going to pieces all around him and that things have never been worse than they are at that present moment. How many generations of people have had the same thought as Habakkuk? That the world is going to pieces all around them, that things couldn't possibly get any worse than they are right now, and that the world is about to come to an end. Habakkuk prophesied some 2,500 years ago. That's a lot of time in which people have been thinking to themselves that the world is about to end. For certainly each generation has had its moments where it appeared that way. And today, it's easy to look around the world Habakkuk saw of desolation, violence, destruction, instability, and wickedness and see our own world. If we go up in our own watchtower and look out at the world today, what do we see? We see the war in Ukraine, which has captured the world's attention for the last six months. We see much human suffering, much danger, and concerns about the return of a Cold War. Personally, I see a friend from high school who's a reporter with the AP stationed in the region and in danger. I also see friends of mine from seminary who are missionaries in Bosnia experiencing firsthand the refugee crisis out of that country. Halfway across the world, we see reports of devastating flooding in Pakistan that has killed at least 1,500 people and displaced many thousands more. Whole communities are gone. Many have lost everything as the waters consume the landscape. We see Venezuela, a country I often remember in my prayers. In 2013, I visited Venezuela for a missions trip while I was in seminary, falling in love with the people there and the country. But they are a people who suffer mightily, threatened by organized and cartel-induced crime, facing severe shortages of basic goods, and experiencing inflation to the point that this past winter many were burning cash to stay warm. We see increased tensions in the China Sea and Taiwan, and between Taiwan and China. Tensions that have filled more and more news reports as of late. These, of course, remind of other East Asian tensions, such as Korea, Myanmar, and Kashmir between Pakistan and India. There we see what the Gospel of Matthew calls wars and rumors of wars. It's not hard to stand in our own watchtowers and see the world as Habakkuk and Dylan saw it. Riders approaching in the night, very real threats with wickedness seeming to overcome righteousness. I confess that sometimes I look out from my own watchtower and see a world that inspires fear, especially with my personal connections to some of these regions. Perhaps that's the case for all of us from time to time, with fear overcoming our hope. For all along our watchtower, we see a world that we want to work together to address some of our greatest crises, like dangerous disputed regions, refugee crises, global tensions, and dangerous regimes. We see the violence, the turmoil, the law that has become slack, the injustice, the strife and contention. And we cry out with the prophet Habakkuk, how long? Save us, God. Habakkuk's 2,500-year-old words ring true to us today. And sometimes we seem to get no word back. We see two riders approaching in the night and no one seems to do anything about it. How do we, a people of faith, respond to a world full of trouble?
Reading reports of the death of Mikhail Gorbachev brought back memories for me, as I'm sure it did for many of you. Even though I was only a boy, I remember watching the Berlin Wall come down. I did not really understand the background at that moment, but I knew somehow it was a very significant event. I remember listening to my parents talk, filled with hope in those years of 1989 and 1990, thinking the Cold War was over and a new peaceful era of hope was emerging. Reports from the week of Gorbachev's death said largely similar things. The expectation that such a peaceful world order would emerge from this post-Cold War environment with a Yeltsin-led Russia moving toward democracy. There would be peace. The threat of nuclear war would abate. And conflicts around the world could easily and readily be solved. Of course, today the world looks very different. Today we mark the anniversary of September 11th. I'm sure you remember that day as well as I do. The fear, the unknown, the chaos, the shock. My Aunt Mary lived in New York at the time, and I remember calling my mom frantically, trying to get a phone line to work, hoping that she was okay. Since then, we've known and have had plenty of reasons to know fear in the world. We need somewhere to find hope in a world that easily inspires fear. We want a world marked by peace like was expected at the end of the Cold War. We pray for a world where violence ceases, where nations work together for the common good of humanity, where vexing problems find innovative and wise solutions. But the world gives us much less reason for hope and much more reason for fear. How do we, a people of faith, respond to a world full of trouble. Here again, the final words of the prophet Habakkuk. He says, though the fig tree does not blossom and no fruit is on the vines, though the produce of the olive fails and the fields yield no food, though the flock is cut off from the fold and there is no herd in the stalls, Yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will exult in the God of my salvation. No matter what he knows, even if the worst occurs, no matter the fear Habakkuk might feel, he says, yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will exult in the God of my salvation. He prays, the profound yet of faith. And that is how we, as a people of faith, respond to a world full of trouble. We pray the profound yet of faith. It's one of the last things Habakkuk says in his prophecy. Even if the worst happens, he will yet rejoice in the Lord who is his strength, making his feet like the feet of a deer, he says, and making him tread upon the heights. No matter the chaos that ensues, God is God, stronger than anything that could happen in the world, present in the world, moving for justice and righteousness and order. That is the message Habakkuk receives up on the ramparts in his watchtower. As he walks and waits and issues his complaints, he sees and hears God give him this message of hope. A message that says, no matter the fear that ensues, we will pray, even if the worst happens yet, you are still God. Habakkuk gives us that witness. Even considering all the turmoil and violence and reasons for fear, Habakkuk alludes to the famous words of Psalm 23. I will fear no evil. Your rod and your staff, which are signs of kingly strength, they comfort me. Habakkuk has hope because he has a faith that says, even if the world is burning, yet you are still God. It's a hope born of knowing that he serves a God who will strike out against injustice, oppression, and violence. They will never have the final word. In God's own time, God will move against God's enemies. In Habakkuk, God tells the prophet that the Babylonians are his tool for now, but 
The day will come when he will act against the Babylonians to protect Israel, when justice will prevail. In fact, by the time we get to the end of this prophecy, Habakkuk has moved his watch. Rather than watching to see if God will act, he is now watching to see how God will destroy the Babylonians, trusting that God will move in strength against God's enemies. Even if the Babylonians come and they steal and kill and destroy, yet God will act on behalf of God's people. Habakkuk has faith in tr and trust in God by praying the profound yet of faith. All along the watchtower, Habakkuk can envision the future when God moves in strength to undo the wickedness of the world. And so he can say in the crucial verse of the entire book, the righteous live by faith. A faith that knows even if the world is chaos, even if there's violence, even if the worst happens, yet we will rejoice in the Lord. We will exult in the God of our salvation. God will save us. God will save the world. It was true that back then, and it's true for us today. The righteous live by that faith. All along his watchtower, Habakkuk discovers that powerful truth, finding the power of praying the profound yet of faith. The profound yet of faith allows the righteous to live by faith, allows the righteous to look out from their watchtowers, see the violence and injustice, and then say, no matter what is seen from the watchtowers, yet God is our refuge and strength, the very present help in times of trouble. Yet I will fear no evil. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will exult in the God of my salvation. So this week, here's the challenge. The 20th century theologian Karl Barth is famous for saying that we are to hold the newspaper in one hand and the Bible in the other. So however you take your news, get it, and then turn to Habakkuk and pray the profound yet of faith, a prayer that might sound like this. Even if violence around the world escalates, even if there's war between China and Taiwan, even if the war in Ukraine widens, even if India and Pakistan go to war over Kashmir, even if we are attacked again by terrorists, even if things get worse, yet God is our refuge and strength, the very present help in times of trouble. Yet I will fear no evil. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Yet, as Habakkuk says, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will exult in the God of my salvation. The prayer of the righteous Sounds like taking the news headline, praying it to God, and adding at the end, yet you, God, are strong, and you will save us. This is how we can have faith, that no matter what we see from our watchtowers, God will provide and will save. How do we, a people of faith, Respond to a world full of trouble? We pray the profound yet of faith. There's much to see from our watchtowers. Yet, God the Lord is our strength. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Christ, our King. In a world where unexpected calamities strike and, when we or, and where we find ourselves confronted with fear and worry, we give you thanks for your holy word, which reminds us that you are strong and you will save us. The mountains may tremble and the earth may give way, yet we will not fear, for you are with us.
Hear us, God, our salvation, as we reflect on the sermon and consider our own yets of faith. O Spirit of the risen Christ, we confess to you that our hearts can be troubled by the news of this world. We hear of wars, famine, natural disasters, and conflict. In these moments, strengthen us to be your people. Let us not be dismayed by the dangers before us, but rather empower us to act as your people in and for the world. Move us towards the hurt and needs of our community. Help us be the salt and light in the midst of our troubled world. Unite and equip us all for this work. Hear us now as we invite your Holy Spirit to work among us and through us. God of comfort, on this the anniversary of one of our nation's greatest tragedies, our minds are also drawn to the tragedies unfolding in our community and around the world today. Be merciful to those who are presently suffering or grieving loss. Bring hope to the hopeless and tend to the afflicted. God, receive our intercessions for the suffering of the world. O God, who reigns forever, from our watchtowers we see many things, yet let our vision be illuminated by the inbreaking light of your coming redemption. Help us to find hope in you, your work, your coming kingdom. We pray all of this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
before we sing our final hymn by way of invitation this morning, I invite you to support UMCOR, that's the United Methodist Committee on Relief. They do a great job assisting those who are experiencing devastation and war and refugee crises and the like around the world. So you can visit UMCOR to give to them if you uh, feel so moved this morning uh, as we have considered those who are experiencing uh, strife and conflict around the world. Now let us remain standing and sing our final hymn together. Let us with the Spirit's daring step from our past and leave behind our disappointment, guilt, and grieving, seeking new paths and sure to find. Christ is alive and goes before us to show and share what love can do. 
This is a day of new beginnings. Our God makes all things new. Amen. Thank you.